Thank you, uh, and welcome to me and to everyone, and er hello out there and in here. Uh, my name is Rikke Tof Nørgo, and I have the great uh, privilege to be allowed to steal some of your time to talk about this meeting in the middle. Could the university be part of an epic we? I also have the great and demanding, uh, scary, I would even say, uh, responsibility to be the coordinator and scientific lead of this EPIC V Horizon Europe project that will be running from 2023 to 2026. And in this talk today, I will share some of the very tentative insights and results from the project, which has the full title of Empowered Participation through Ideating Cultural Worlds and Environments, EPIC V. You have to have a great acronym, right? Um, and uh, the, it's focusing on the call upon universities to meet in the middle and join forces with cultural organizations, creative industries, and young people in society, culture, and education to form what we call an epic we in equal quadruple helix partnerships. So one of the focal points of the project is to research and contribute to futures worth having uh, in the meeting point between culture, industries, education, universities, young citizens, and to see what kind of tales of tomorrows, you could say, these partners can formulate together and for themselves when they meet and work together in earnest, on the ground, in the dirt, in the middle. And especially for today's talk, the project seeks to contribute with uh, design-based research, knowledge and innovation in the form of ecosystems, frameworks, models and principles for how to Opera, rationalize, materialize, and enact this in the world. And these principles that I will introduce you to today is aimed at underpinning and helping bringing about these new futures, these new practices uh, between these partners, and that can be taken up by other partners within the sector, so higher education, culture, industries, society, or the public. In this way, Epic Ways also responds to Reading's call uh, in the university in ruins to reimagine education, revitalize and re evolutionize the university in ruins, as he calls it, to imagine and enact tales of tomorrow, uh, which is the theme of, of this excellent conference, and to see beyond the ruinous landscape of present day universities with, without kind of recourse to romantic nostalgia, as he calls it, and while reflecting on what it means to dwell in those ruins and what can be built from those uh, broken bricks. So the urgent call to reimagine has only kind of grown in strength since Redding's book came out in 1996 and turned to in, into what some calls an imagination crisis that has caught us like a deer in the headlights, a little bit like me just now. Uh, oh, and now it's, I can't see anything because I looked up into the lights. Uh, and I think that's a very good metaphor for how we kind of are in higher education and the universities today. We cannot see far ahead because we are blinded by the present day realities. We are unable to move away from a future that is simply handed to us and where all we have to do is make it so. And also where we become kind of unable or told not to imagine utopian tales of tomorrow in the form of wider and wilder futures for the universities and higher education well beyond what is kind of deemed realistic uh, from the perspective of today's present reality. So we need to break this mold and build something new, new tales and new futures from those shards. Not by ourselves, but by actually partnering up with the surrounding domains, the surrounding sectors, the whole of society to catalyze institutional and social imagination, to widen the possibility space of what could be potential sales of tomorrow and to create and enact new ecosystem models, practices. If not, we will only get more of the same. So for the last 10 years, I've been occupied with this futuring of higher education and the university, specifically looking into the transformation of institutions, the future role in society they might hold, and how this creates new needs, potentials, and possibilities. Especially, I've been focusing on the potential of future, futures and practices of higher education institutions on the macro and the meso level, uh, on the abstract and medium level, uh, but it has primarily been imaginative, utopian, and philosophical, up in the sky, thinking and writing. So in Epic We, this thinking and writing, in is, we are trying to move this thinking and and riding from up in the sky to down in the dirt, 
through everyday on the ground practices of developing and acting and evaluating these kind of research grounded ecosystems, models, principles and practices for future in the university and higher education on the macro and meso level and also on the micro level through concrete activities. But I won't talk that much about that today. You can hit me up later if you want to know more. I'll be here the whole day. So, Epic We brings together four different partner types to form these kind of transformative partnership in the middle through close collaboration and co-creation. These four domains or sectors meet in the middle in these uh, cultural hubs, as we call them. And each cultural hub consists of a research education partner, a creative industry partner, a cultural organization or museum partner, and young citizens or the public as the fourth Helix partner. Each of these four partners represents and bring with them uh, into the middle a distinctive societal domain and with their own kind of knowledges, methods and cultures that has to intermingle uh, and co-act together in the middle. Epigree is carried out as this kind of design-based research and innovation project with 12 partners from around the world in these three cultural hubs in Aarhus, Hilversum and Obidos. Um, and they meet in the middle on, in kind of through everyday practices to see what kind of happens when they do act, think together. The aim is to strengthen and extend each Helix partner's cultural and civil roles in, in society and the societal position they have by meeting and collaborating in the middle through these Epic We cultural hubs. So concretely, to an enter and enact such meetings in the middle, build new ways of, of doing and being and thinking together, whether it be in higher education, creative industries, cultural organizations, or young people's everyday visions of futures they might have and hold, it requires new ecosystem, knowledge, cultures, and collaboration models. To achieve this, Epic We adopts and adapts on the macro level the quadruple helix ecosystems, as you see here, uh, that was kind of um, coined or uh, materialized in a first version in the book um, Knowledge Creation, Diffusion and, U Diffusion and Use in Innovation Networks and Knowledge Clusters by Kayanis and Campbell that have further developed it and others have taken it up and developed it into specific kind of positions. And on the meso level, using and adopting the method of living labs as concrete spaces and practices of being together in messy spaces. The quadruple helix system also, when we look across literature reviews, as our principles are built on, besides practicing them, we find that the most potent ecosystem drivers were public participation, so in, uh, inclusion of the fourth helix partner, cooperation between Helix partners, so meeting in the middle, and then long-term commitment within the Helix, so not a one-off activity, but actually being there over the years together. The three core aspects that other literature reviews shown have kind of provided value for all Helix partners, whatever they make, make and mean by value, are what is called more free knowledge production, so combining and integrating different knowledges and innovation modes that look strange, uh, coexistence, co-evolution, co-specialization of new modes of enacting within the four sectors and in the middle, and a shift from what is presently called perhaps the knowledge economy into knowledge cultures and knowledge democracy. So not producing something for the economy, but trying to do and enact a culture together, try to do it in democratic ways. More concretely, uh, the preliminary result of this work is the Epic We Protocol 1, Quadruple Helix Cultural Innovation, Epic We Quadruple Helix Cultural Ecosystem and Cultural Hubs that you see here, and was just reviewed by the European Commission, and they said, okay, go, so it will be out later uh, this year. Um, and it shows or presents the principles and approaches taken by the project, but also the first contribution to the domains and the sectors. And what we see when examining publications, projects, proven practices, prior projects about this kind of quadruple helix uh, meeting in the middle approach is there are some recurring patterns that emerge. From these patterns and cutting across research and practice, we can derive these kind of guiding principles that I will share in the remaining part of this talk today for the design and realization 
of a quadruple helix ecosystem that are tailored explicitly to the four sectors that I mentioned and are tailored explicitly from also the perspective of higher education, creative industry, culture and young people to get over themselves, go beyond themselves and meet in the middle to see what will kind of emerge there. So, diving into the principles. To, when we look across to so the first, there are, four print, there are eight principles, two times four, that are kind of combined together from this 70 page long report. Um, each of them are kind of guidelines or new kind of flashlights to look for how to practice higher education on the ground through teaching and practices or up in the air uh, together. So the first recommendation coming from this work is to include citizens as an equal partner. To see citizens as positioned as the invention and practitioners of their own desired cultural products and futures also when they are in education, but especially when they meet in the middle, that they are included as central research and innovation helix partner, so they are an actual partner, not just something we go and ask or test something on. The second one is to see in a to do innovation when also when we think about higher education in the middle and through democratic and participatory processes. So uh, we need an equal distribution of the Helix partner in the cultural hub so we can meet together and they also need to have equal representation and rights. Higher education is not there for the sake of employability, creative industry partners are not there for the sake of case competition and so on and so forth. So we need to see each other as co-researchers, co-designers, co-practitioners, co-innovators, and we also need to bring with us into the middle our own kind of practices, but also be open for them to be transformed in strange ways. Thirdly, we need to enact cross-sectoral collaboration within a co-creating partnership. So actually take this uh, seriously, uh, not just something we'd say we are doing, but actually are doing it, both on the macro level, where we have take joint decisions, collaborate on shared aims, objectives and outcomes, and establish a common vocabulary and understanding so we can think and talk together. That has taken the first year, pretty much, to be able to talk and think together because we don't use the same language, we don't mean the same things when we use our words. On the meso level, to form these local hubs that meet monthly to ensure joint development of principles and protocols for how we should do things so we can actually act and be together in a meaningful way in the middle. And on the micro level to organize specific events and activities where all Helix partners are in the space together and in act together, whether that be higher education activities, creative cultural events or whatever. So they, this is a way to manifest these new tales of tomorrow to see if they work and to see if the joint in the middle, meeting in the middle practices actually makes sense. The last principle uh, from the Quadruple Helix framework is cultivating these new uh, ways of cultural knowledge and innovation culture that looks very strange. So here, uh, the ecosystem works towards reciprocal value and creation. If it only makes value or meaning to one of the sectors, it does not make sense. If you're only doing this for one of the sectors, it does not make sense. It needs to both have value for each individual Helix partner and value for the creation of this combined helices as the joint force in the middle. And that's very complicated. So that also, of course, creates internal tensions and differences when it comes to what counts as good knowledge, good research, uh, good practices, methods, uh, outcomes, value, and so on. We need to find that sweet spot. Otherwise, it is totally way more easy to do it on our own. Then we don't need each other. So again, consequently, the whole should be greater than the sum of its part. We should do something we can actually not do on our own. Otherwise, it's easier to do it on our own. So this also means that our way of thinking from academia, from the university, from higher education are equally critically important and so are the other sectors and that their specialized knowledge, their strange way of doing things are equally appreciated. We should not jump for each other, but we should meet in the middle. So combined, we also see, so combined we could see kind of a double helix university as a potential tale of tomorrow where we include citizens as central university partner where we enact cross-sectoral uh, collaboration within a co-creating partnership when we try to figure out how higher education of tomorrow might look. 
where we innovate the university using democratic and participatory bottom-up processes, which is quite foreign, uh, and where we integrate alternative, more free knowledges and innovation cultures also in our institutions when we do research and education, even though they seem very alien and strange. And this is all very well, but it's still kind of up in the sky. So how do we actually perform that in an everyday way on the ground? So the first one coming from living labs, so is to kind of formulate this cultural hub, this living lab in the middle, where we are meeting and doing everything together. So we are meeting monthly, we are sending 50 emails a day, we are, when we take a decision, we take it together and so on. Some decisions are more interesting for some of the partners than others, but each and every one of these decisions and meetings are equally important. So cultural hubs, as, as we offer them uh, in the protocol, are based on Living Lab's principles. They transform this quadruple helix ecosystem into everyday practices by bringing together the partners and engaging them in on-the-ground practice. So this sp specifically requires, as we've seen over the, over the first year of the project, uh, initial decentering of pre exists pre-existing sector-confined ways of knowing, doing, and being. If we go into this partnership as a university, academic, uh, uh, discipline, study, group, whatever, and already know what should be done, then we have already kind of lost the reason for meeting in the middle. So we need to decenter and say we know nothing about what is in the middle. Secondly, we need to enable a censoring a meeting, an intermingling of these new modes of collective and co-creating, knowing, doing, and being, by meeting there and thinking otherwise, and doing otherwise, and being otherwise, that we would normally do to, to kind of see this is this other thing, this is this one other thing we might actually start doing together. The second one is uh, seeing Living Labs as a cultural meeting place, as a cultural uh, communal ownership, so it's four alien cultures kind of flying in from the spaceship, meeting together and try to do cooperative operation and democratic participation together, even though they don't speak the same languages and they have to perhaps use uh, uh, sign language in the beginning uh, or see they talk between each other, oh, this does not mean bread, this means water or whatever. So for this to happen, we must meet each other halfway and we must leave behind this preconception. That also means for higher education, we don't know how an activity should look. We don't really know what is the most important thing to learn. We don't know what is the method to use and so on. That might come from the other sectors. No one knows, no one owns or knows the other. Also, it's, import, it's important to embrace this cultural alien and it's very uncomfortable for all four sectors in the project across all three hubs because it feels alien and it was not what I really would like to do and it's not how it really was supposed to look. But then we t continuously need to meet each other halfway and be open when we start to practice this thing. Together we can do this alien thing which we could not do before. In Epic We it's in the form of cultural game jams uh, creating 84 games through and for culture, but with the young people that counts as the research object, the education objects, the cultural objects, and the creative industry objects all at once, this one thing. Thirdly, uh, we need to inhabit the living lab as a vibrant cultural home. So it's not something we talk about, it's we actually meet, we're actually doing the activities together, even though we really do not have the time, uh, even though we would rather send someone else even though we would rather let the young people do it on their own, we are there all the time. So a game jam is a 48-hour event, so we are there, we slept at Aros, the uh, art museum, uh, we were there, we, we spent the time there, even when it did not make sense. So actually building a home together. This also requires real-world, real-life sites of culture. For this project, it could be other sites wherein we can practice this, so it could be museums, public spaces, libraries, cultural centers, cultural heritage sites, creative industry sites for the Epic V project, some sort of living culture that we, can, uh, that we can have as a meeting in the middle meeting point. Importantly, the idea is not to overpower this site, so we don't come in and transform it. We come in and also listen to the site, the atmosphere, and see what mood it brings into us. So it, otherwise it's not a home, then it's like we do at Aarhus Ø at the time, eradicate what was there and then build skyscrapers. 
I don't know how it is in Kreuzberg, uh, but I saw some interesting signs coming up here. Last principle from the living labs are to actually, which is core to this project, but I also think core, if you want to have a future together in the middle, is to aim for empowered participation. And for the EPICV project, that's empowered participation in culture. We need to feel empowered rather than disempowered. Otherwise, we should say, I'd rather not. And that's okay. That's important. So the goal of the cultural hubs are to provide environments for empowered participation for all four sectors. If one feels disempowered, then the tail is lost, so to speak, or the future is lost. So this is what we should evaluate on collectively and individually to position East Cordoba partner as an indispensable and equal contributor within the cultural hub. And we saw this kind of disempowerment, especially with the young people in the beginning. So now we are establishing a youth advisory board on the same level as the expert advisory board, and we are bringing them in on the executive board to make joint decisions with us. So they actually feel empowered and it's not something we just say they are. Cultural hubs only flourish when their Cordoba Helix partners flourish. So we need to feel at home, respected and acknowledged. This is what the cultural hubs are to be evaluated on. And as academics, we need to feel equally respected and acknowledged as do the creative industry partners, the cultural organizations and the young people. So this is also what EPIC we stands for, empowered participation through ideating cultural worlds and environments. Cultural worlds and environments are, of course, the game worlds that we make for and through culture, but it's also the cultural sites we enter into and transform by being there and listening. It's also the cultural hub on the meso level, which is a new kind of world and environment for the future of higher education and the other sectors. And it's on the macro level when we look across actually joining forces when we think about this. So bringing these four things... Oh, sorry. Ah, this is... I have two clickers, really confusing. So living labs are also a, a meso-level format, perhaps for uh, a university in a cultural hub or a university for tomorrow. And it can be on the ground, it can be a, a study program, it can be single persons like me, uh, it can be a whole institution, doesn't really matter. But we have this meso level where we utilize living labs to kind of materialize the double helix that are still kind of up in the air to bring it into the dirt on the ground and, and see the university and bring it to life as a double helix partner. Then try to set them up as these cultural meeting places going somewhere else, doing otherwise, thinking otherwise, seeing what's in the middle then inhabit, inhabiting them over time as these cultural homes where something new, new institutional dreams, new higher education dreams, new glimpses of something that could be otherwise that kind of is kicked back into our own everyday practices at our institutions by, by actually thinking, meeting, meeting and acting together. And we can see this starting to happen. Uh, in all of the sectors that they start actually to do otherwise. It's the young people that came to us and said, we want to be involved in the research part of the project, not only doing the games, but actually having a say. We can see it in the creative industry sector that started to work together with other cultural organizations, Moscow Museum, for example, that they haven't done before. And we can see it in the higher education sector where we are starting to think about new formats of doing research doing teaching and learning on that are going somewhere else. And we can see it in the cultural sector where they are starting <laughs> to do research presentation with us, start to open the spaces in new ways and be open for young people coming to game jam with their uh, very respective cultural heritage and do strange things with them that might not be what they envision, but what the young people envision. And lastly, this is what we're trying to practice for this empowered participation. It's not a success yet, it's still not there, but we are trying our best to be less disempowered, you could say. One minute left, according to my time. So, bringing it all together, what is it for? So, what we could start to think about, could the future university become part of an epic we? Perhaps it could start to materialize each on our own, in each in our own ways through taking up these cooperative double helix partnerships, through making these collaborative cultural hubs, and through co-creating co these tales of tomorrow, 
And it doesn't need spe specifically to be as Epic V with game jams and games through and for culture. It could be in all other forms. If you are interested, last slide. If you are interested in any way, you can go to the website. Like, how does this actually look in the dirt? So on the website, we have the first games made. We will kind of publish everything in the public domain because we don't want to make money. Uh, and it should be usable by all. So it's also under Creative Commons, so people can adopt and adjust and transform it in any way they like. Um, and also, over the next two years, we'll try to become wiser, become wider, and become wilder slowly by expanding our tales of tomorrow, expanding how this might look, feel, and how we might, might think and act if we stand there in the middle. And it would be nice to stand there together with you. So please reach out if this in any way seems interesting at all. We're here to play. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rika. Uh, we do already have some questions in the chat. If there's more questions, just be quick and type them into the chat. Also, if you're here present in Berlin on site, just type your questions, use your smartphones and be part of the discussion. I'm also here all day. All day. That's awesome. Let's connect. Um, so, Waltraud Ritter wants to know, how are these co-creations and community practices funded? How are the contributions of citizens recognized? So, the contributions of citizens are not recognized through money, sadly. I think if we should do one thing otherwise in uh, the application, we would have done that. Uh, but money is not the most important thing, I would say. It's the money allowing us to do this thing. Uh, and it's a EU, EU Horizon project, so it's EU funded with around 3 million euros or something like that. Svetanka Walter writes, I love the idea of meeting in the middle and the metaphor of embracing the cultural alien. And she adds, yes, not just talking about culture, but living culture. So much wisdom in your presentation. Thanks, Rika. And actually, that's all of the questions for the moment. So maybe uh, let me jump in there. Is there anything you just mentioned that's something you would do differently if you were to run the project again? Is there anything else you say, well, we didn't account for this or that would be a great um, iteration? I think the nice thing that this is a science-based research mm. project it's all about the iterations and the mm. building up. So we actually uh, accomplished to <laughs> get funding for something we didn't really know what would be. Mm. And I think that's quite rare today. Um, so that's one thing. And then when we see these things, we try to add them in to think differently and otherwise about how the money could be spent. So again, <laughs> that's also different. So trying to involve the youth, give them opportunities as they see them and as they want them. Mm. So we're very kind of in conversation with them, but the, the, empower, the, the engagement needs to come for them. And then we try to amplify that voice or empower those practices by thinking otherwise about how the project could look. And that's still very uncomfortable. We have an upcoming meeting where we have to decide about how seriously we should take them as a partner. And I'm really hoping that we'll take them seriously. I'm quite convinced we will because we are excited for this. So, so, so I think the next project will just be wiser. And we will never become wise, but we will become wiser as we move along. What was your biggest aha moment? Or like where you realized, wow, this was really a prejudice I went in or a wrong conception? I think the biggest aha moment came after we had our first uh, game jam intervention in Aarhus. Uh, and the young people came up afterwards and, and wanted to be involved, either because they disagreed or agreed or uh, we said they uh, you, you had this vision of empowerment and say, well, then you need to do this. And that was all about diversity, uh, being on the spectrum, uh, how, the de how the design materials should look, what the research should be about, everything else. And I think that was a truly like a, a profound aha moment of, okay, so this, this is working because it's not working. They are actually coming to us and wanting to be involved, something we, we perhaps rarely see. And then the aha moment would be to let them in, in a sense that they become a partner in the middle and not just stand outside with their perspective about things should be, but actually come in there with us, which might also be uncomfortable for them, like it is for us. Mm. 
Thanks a lot for joining us today, giving us this great insight. Everybody who's here present on site, use the opportunity to talk to Rike, connect with her and get more insights. And I'm sure maybe you'll also check into the platform over the course of the day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.